Well, good almost afternoon. It's almost there, so I hope you all are doing well. This is our third week in the book of Colossians. We started a series in the book of Colossians. We are still in chapter one. That's good. We, we don't want to get in a hurry. We want to understand God's word, so who knows? Maybe we'll finish it up sometime this year. We'll see what happens. Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians for a reason. There was a lot of false, well, there was false uh, teaching coming into the church during this time. Paul had never visited the church, but um, the leader of the church at that time had come to him and expressed his concern, so he wrote a letter to help the church and refute these heresies that were coming out. False teaching was kind of a Jewish legalism and this Greek mysticism. It was kind of a mix, and eventually it would be called Gnosticism. And when I tried to look into this religion and try to give you a little background on it, uh, it, was, it was tough. And I came across an article and it said it was like nailing down a flopping fish. It was really hard to figure out too. So I stopped right there, uh, start try, stopped trying to figure it out and just get down to the basics. And what they were trying to do was deny the deity of Christ. They were denying his humanity as well. They were also denying his sufficiency for salvation. They'd lost it all at that point, those false teachers. And they were trying to lead the church down that road as well. So Paul opens up this letter, and if we look in chapter 1, and that's where we'll start at, Paul uh, greets them. He says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. He goes on and he says, we are always Thank, we always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. So vital for this church to uh, just make sure they're on track, that they were educating the saints. And uh, Paul was obviously, this is a big concern of his as well. He continues on and uh, He says this, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul goes on and he he prays he has this prayer in this letter but he goes on he starts out just by slapping down this false teaching that was going on he starts out with the preeminence of christ the preeminence of christ is basically sum it up jesus is god so he works from there and in, in verse 15 He says this, he says, He is the image, talking about Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, he says. And in him all things hold together. So what Paul's doing at the first part of this is he is explaining that Jesus is the Lord of creation. He starts tearing down this false teaching. He goes on and he... goes into verse 18 and he says he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself in all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of the cross in this passage Paul now is explaining his new creation, and that is the church. 
about 23, 24 years ago, uh, there was a young lady, a teenage lady here at our church that would teach a preschool class. She was in high school. And um, God used her in a mighty way. And he, he taught these, I think they were called wee ones. I can't remember. He, she called her class. Um, but uh, she taught her class the basics, obviously. They're preschoolers. But she taught them that Jesus is God. And uh, when we were driving out of this church, this was, we just started going here. I did not know the Lord. And uh, we just pulled out. I remember we're on 240th right here, and this little toddler in the back seat was going on about Sunday school. And uh, she exclaims, Jesus is God. And I'm like, Wow. In all the years, I went to church as a young kid, or even up till teenage years, I'd never heard this. I wasn't sure. It's like, but when she said this, this whole thing had changed my, my life. I mean, I knew Jesus was a Savior. I knew Jesus was the Son of God. But I never heard that. I never thought about that. And when I heard that, I didn't... It, I didn't even question it. It was like, wow, this is amazing. And because I went to church as a, 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 the first part of my life up until my teenage years, and we just started going back to church, it was kind of embarrassing that I didn't know this. <laughs> but when I'd go out and I'd give the gospel to other people, I made sure they know, knew who Jesus was. He was the Son of God. He was God himself. He was the Creator. And I always do that when I give the gospel to somebody now. Little did this high school girl know, or maybe she did know, I don't know, the influence that she would have on this little girl to the influence that she had on her 36-year-old father at the time. But it was amazing. This uh, young lady's name was uh, Elizabeth Coppice, or Marie, as her dad would call her. <laughs> which I guess was her original name, but she went back by Elizabeth. But anyway, and it was just great to see how God has used somebody in the body of Christ to change one little girl, but to change her father and to change, hopefully, lives of others as we go out and give the gospel to many people and help them know who Jesus Christ is. When I was looking into this, uh, um, studying on this passage, I also came across a guy by the name of Chuck Quarles. He was a, a uh, professor at um, um, Southeastern Seminary. And he gives a similar story. He says this. He says that he was in the library talking or studying up on something. He got in a conversation with a young man who had traveled all over the world. And this young man had, he started sharing Christ with this young man and, and he got to the point where he told this young man that Jesus is God. And the young man stopped and he said, He'd never heard that before. He'd went to church uh, most of his younger life, and now he's out researching all different types of religions. He never heard this before. And so, I, during the week I was looking at something. I've, I've heard this passage many times last week when I was looking into this. I stopped that message. I didn't get to finish it. And, um, of course, I come across... Uh, um, in Matthew 16, 16 and 17, Jesus is asking his disciples, what, who do you think the people think that I am out there? And they tell him, oh, they think you're Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. You know? And Jesus asks them, he says, well, who do you think I am? And Simon Peter replies in verse 16, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Some person didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. So God reveals this, this very fact to people when he decides that they need to know that, is what I found out. 
I plugged that message back in and finished. I, at some point in the week, I was able to finish up that guy's message. <laughs> and come to find out, he, he started talking about when he was a 17-year-old that he was witnessing to a Jehovah Witness. And, the, and he wanted him to come to, this Jehovah Witness to come to church. But this Jehovah Witness finally said, I cannot go to your church. I do not believe what you guys believe. I do not believe that Jesus is God. And Chuck Quarles, this young man, says, we don't believe that. He was confused too. But he goes on to pastor a church. He goes on, he was two years into teaching at a, a Bible college when this fact had hit him. He thought that Jesus being God was just another doctrine. He never really gave it the full heart thought. He didn't really think of the preeminence of Christ and what it meant in his life. He, fought, he went to the, the president of the university and told him and said he wanted to get rebaptized. He was baptized as a kid. And the, the, the president said, Are you sure you want to do that? You don't know what you're getting yourself into. And he was sure he wanted to do that. And uh, he was so glad that he did. He had no regrets after that. But uh, again, we just don't understand when Christ will, re or, well, Christ or God will reveal this truth to us. Um, we're not quite sure. But nevertheless, the preeminence of Christ, it tells us everything we need to know. And it's just the beginning of our salvation at that point. Today, I'm going to finally get into the, our passage in verse 18. We are his possession. Think about this. We are Christ's possession. He is the head of the body and the church. Okay. When we look into this, uh, verse 15 and 17 talks about his preeminence over creation, everybody and everything. But when we start in 18, now we see his new creation at this point. This new creation, his church. The believers. Paul has another description, the body for them. Christ is the head of the body as well. The term head carries both a functional and symbolic meaning. We know the head controls the body. Okay. We know that as it controls the body, it controls our bodies in creation, decision making, authority, and control. As Jesus would be the head of the body of Christ head of believers also. But it also has a symbolic meaning. Of course, it's the source of creation, decision-making, authority, and control. And this is how Christ uses his body. Christ used a young teenage girl to make a difference in other people's lives. This is how he uses his body. The church. One thing we think about as the church, Christ has also done something very special for us. He has separated us from all the other ruling that he has out there. He rules us differently. We are a different people. We are set apart for his good work, his special purpose. We are set apart at the moment we come into salvation for eternity. We're changed. We still live a physical life, but someday this will all go away. But we are eternal at this point, eternally living. God also, as he goes through his word, he has different um, ways of uh, using us as examples. And one of those ways is um, he talks about us as being sheep. And a lot of people get a little offended about that because they know sheep are not the brightest animal out there. However, when you think of an infinite God, I think God is very gracious by calling us sheep and him the good shepherd because, you know, it's, there's no way we'll ever get to that point. There's no way that, uh, you know, it's just he's narrowed the gap for us uh, when it comes to intellect between us and him. It's infinite what his, his knowledge is. And so he's very gracious to us. But he calls us his sheep. And he loves his sheep. He is the good shepherd. John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own and my own know me. One of the things that happens is once we come to salvation, there's a change in our life, a huge change in our life. And it doesn't come all on at once. Thankfully, it would overwhelm us probably, but we do know the Lord. We know truth. We know that what is written in here is true. And this encourages us, this helps us find peace, and most of all, this convicts us and directs us out of sin. This is how we know Christ. His Spirit also is indwelled in us, helping us, encouraging us, giving us peace, convicting us. This is how God works through us. This is the gift that He has given us. And this is how we know Him, and He knows us. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. This is such a special relationship. The triune God has a beautiful relationship. They know each other so well and love each other so much. And Jesus would give us the same type of relationship. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus in his perfection, Jesus hates sin, yet Jesus would take our sin, be the sin bearer on the cross and die for our sin. Another analogy Jesus uses when he's talking to his disciples, he's trying to get them out of the world at this point. They're too caught up in the world. I am guilty. He says, quit worrying and seek God's kingdom, he tells them. In Luke 12, 32, he says, Fear not, little flock, sheep, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Not only have we sinned against the Holy God, not only have we, we been disobedient against Him, He has saved us not of any works or any good things we have done. It is all because of His grace that He has done this. And not only would He save us from sin and give us eternal life, He's going to give us a kingdom. This is huge. As Christ's possession, his new creation, he also sets us apart as a special possession, a special people. We are set apart. We are sanctified. We are made holy because of what Christ has done for us. We are made holy through the blood shed of Christ on the cross. And as a part of God's family, Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. He takes it down to even a more intimate level at this point. We're his family. Hebrews 2.11 says this, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, Jesus. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. I think about my own sin and I would think, I would be ashamed to call me a brother. However, Jesus covers those sins, covers those transgressions, and never remembers them no more. You become his brother and sister. So again, as a special possession, we are set apart for that. Jesus spoke of, his, of himself as being sanctified. He says, and that for their sake, in John 17, 19, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. In other words, he is holy, he is set apart from sin. His followers are to likewise be set apart for sin and for God's use. In 1 Peter 1, 16, it says this, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy given us direction he's covered our sins another beautiful example of us being his special possession his new creation is the example of the church being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom This is obviously a very profound and exclusive relationship between people, a man and a woman. 
But now it's between the church and Christ. Ephesians 5.25 says this, Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing and the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. Christ would go that far, show his love so much that he would cover our sins and, and he would wash us in the water of his word. And he obviously expects his, the husbands of wives to do this. As we think of this, this uh, symbolism of a marital relationship between the church and Christ, the, in biblical times, uh, we think about that there's this betrothal period Engagement, I can say that easier than betrothal, but engagement time period. And this is a time where the bridegroom and the bride would separate before they were married. And sometimes this could go up to a year. And, and the groom would go off and prepare, maybe add to his uh, dad's house, his father's house, and a place for his, him and his bride and their family, or build a place, or whatever it took to prepare this time. And it would be similar to the church as the bride of Christ. We are in the church age at this point. This is when we are separate from Christ. And it goes on and it would say that the responsibility of that bride would be to be faithful to her bridegroom. And in Ephesians 5.24 it says, The church submits to Christ. As the church submits to Christ... Wives, submit to your husbands. Church, submit to Christ. At the rapture, the church will all be united. This, this time starts in Acts chapter 2 the, at Pentecost and goes up to the rapture at this point. This would be the church age. And then the rapture happens and the church will be united with the bridegroom at this point. And the official wedding ceremony will take place as we see in Revelation 19, 7, and set, uh, verses 7 and 9. And this is the eternal union of Christ and his bride, the church. In this eternal state, believers will have access to the heavenly city known as the New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is also described in verse 9 as also the bride, but uh, it means something different. It's kind of like this is the church, but we are actually the church. Believers are actually the church. And this... Uh, sounds as if it's the same thing, that this would be, this bride, this new Jerusalem, would be the inhabitants of the, new, the body of Christ at this point. When we think of his possession, his, his creation for us, we think of his love and how much he cares for us through these things. We, we also know this, that the church exists to glorify him. He's our Savior. And it's not for our good, our salvation, but it's for His glory. We really have to think about that. But we are so blessed to be a part of it. I mean, so blessed falls so short. I mean, it's just overwhelming to think about that if you really give it thought. So as we come to terms with the fact that Christ, we are His special possession, we remember this, that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We've been changed. We are prepared for eternity. Christ is bringing us into eternity. Christ loves us. Not because we deserve that. This is our preeminent Christ. In the second part of verse 18, it talks about his position, who he is, and what he's done. It says this, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He is at the beginning there. His position is at the beginning, but 
as we see in verse 17, he was before all things. He created beginning. He created creation. So he's there even before that. And back then, they would understand this. This would make sense to them. He's the firstborn uh, from the dead. Jesus' resurrection would mark the beginning of his new creation. That resurrection is a pivotal moment for all of us that are in Christ. In the Greek, this word could mean physically born in the family first. However, uh, as you look at it, it is first position. If we look in the context of the scripture, when we look at 17, it says he is before all things. And they knew this, and they would understand this, especially when you look into the Old Testament. In Exodus 4.22, Moses is talking to Pharaoh, or Moses is going to talk to Pharaoh. Right now, he's talking to the Lord. The Lord is actually talking to Moses, as I'm getting this all straightened out for you. <laughs> but uh, God is talking to Moses. He says, then say to Pharaoh, he says, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. There are many nations before Israel. However, now God has put Israel in that position. So this would make sense to them back then. In Psalm 89, 27, there's many kings before David. However, this passage shows the preeminence of David over all the kings in the, of the nations at that time. Psalms 89, 27 says this, And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. From the dead, Jesus was the first to be resurrected from the dead. This is the inauguration of his new creation. This resurrection would guarantee the resurrection of those in the body. We have a guarantee through his resurrection to have eternal life. We do see others in the Bible that were resurrected, but remember this, they did die again. So just something to think about that. It's interesting, when we look at this passage, and it talks about he is the beginning, he is the firstborn of the, from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. A lot of false religions out there today go to this passage to uh, try to change your mind on who Christ is. <laughs> and... Um, Especially Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses do this quite often. And, and when I've talked to them before, it's, it's just they're kind of stuck in this, this problem with that. And um, I, when I speak to them, I stick with just one thing, the deity of Christ. I don't change from there. They'll try to change. I don't. I stay on this and I keep talking. Going to John 1.1, 1, 1, he's... In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Down in 114, the Word became flesh. And we just kind of work through that. But finally they get tired of that. I, was, I had some Mormon guys over a couple of weeks ago. They stopped by our house. And same thing, I just take them to the deity of Christ and I talk to them about that. And I kept talking, I kept talking. I don't give them much chance to talk. Just trying to get them to understand, hey, this is what I know. You know, Jesus is God. Oh, he's a, a God. No, he is God. We just keep working on, from, on there from that. And finally, a couple of weeks ago, one of them, they, they seemed like they were listening, and one of them said, can we tell your neighbors that uh, we've talked to you and that we could tell them more about what, what, what we have? I go, no, no, you can't do that. I will not let you go out into my neighborhood and lead my neighbors to the same fate that you guys have. You guys have an eternal destiny, and it is hell. And it's unfortunate. But think about it, guys. You know, just begging and pleading, not begging and pleading, but just a plea to think about what I've talked to you guys about. You know. And no, don't go into my neighbors and tell them this. I've been talking to them about the real Jesus, the real God. In verses 19 and 20, we hear about Christ's peace for us. Verse 19, it says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In this verse, Paul dismantles the false teaching that Christ, 
was just merely an emanation of God. That is what Gnosticism taught. But he is God. Paul reiterates this again in Colossians 2.9. He says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is God. Jesus is preeminent. And Jesus is uh, sufficient for salvation. I think about this, and it makes sense, but nobody else could die for my sins but Christ. God himself, the perfect one. He's far sufficient for my sins. And it's, it's hard for people to grasp that sometimes, but it's just... It's, it's an amazing thing in my own life, and I'm sure for many of you out there, but why would he do this for us? And uh, you know, that's his love for us. We are his special possession, his special creation, and this is how he has brought us peace. And verse 20 says this. It says, And through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his, cr of his cross. The word translated, reconciled, translated into the Greek, means to change thoroughly. It's a, it's a huge change. It's a total redo at this point. And because of our sinful state, we must have the right relationship with God. And the only way we can do that is through the sacrifice of Christ, this work that he had done on the cross for us, by the blood that was shed on this cross. God's righteousness is satisfied through what Jesus had accomplished there. This brings us peace between God and those he has restored. Before there's this barrier up there, God cannot contend with sin. He can't deal with sin. He is a holy God. However, Christ has provided a way, a peace between us and God by doing this. I do this kind of this exercise in my, in my head sometimes and I think about this. I, I think, you know, it's on my deathbed, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, I, I have this bucket list I want to do in life. I want to accomplish all these things. And it seems so silly when I think about when I'm on my deathbed that these things would be important to me. And uh, over the years, it's kind of changed my thought on a lot of things, but I still go through this and I'm thinking, what is important to me? What is of value to me when I'm laying there and I'm about to pass from this life into the next? You know. And I'm sure at this point you would really do a lot of assessing of your life. So I started doing it kind of early. And one thing to think about is this preeminence of Christ. What does this mean to us? How has this changed our life what does this do to us do we mix a little bit of world and the lord with that or do we get a good mix do we do 50 50 you know 60 40 what do we do you know and we think about christ and the preeminence of him there has to be kind of a, a mindset a change in that a reset and um and i'm always convicted on this and I was reading an article when I was looking into this, a guy by the name of Dr. Greg Stikes from Bob Jones University, and he says, but it is not enough that Jesus have prominence in our life. And prominence is somebody very important. And, I, and when I read this article, I'm thinking about, yeah, prominence. Jesus does have prominence in my life. He's very important to me. But he goes a little farther in his article. He says, he must have preeminence in our life. Jesus cannot simply be on our top ten list. He must be our everything, this guy says. The title of this article is The, Un Un the Uncomfortable Implications of the Preeminence of Christ. 
And that makes me very uncomfortable. (laughs) But conviction is so crucial in our lives. And it's an ongoing change that goes on. And and, uh, you might hit 60 years old at some point. But the change has to continue. And uh, I love to see that change in my life, but it's a struggle. I have to pray hard for that. I want to hold on to this world. I want the good things of this life, too. But I do see how Christ is working in me, that some of these things are just not as important as they used to be. And uh, I pray that he continues to work on my life and, and pull me out of the world and make him the preeminent one in my life. And I hope that you might consider that too. Maybe some of you are already there. I don't know. But some of you that would struggle with that, I'm with you on that. But that would be my prayer for me and my prayer for you, that Jesus would become the preeminent one in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, who would know that some false teaching a couple of thousand years ago, could change the life of men today, could bring out uh, a very, the very fact that Jesus is God, that Jesus is preeminent, and can continue to change your people in a way that would honor and glorify you, Lord. I pray that we understand the importance of that. I pray that our lives are changed because of your word and these truths, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to just study your word and and have these things come out and convict myself, Lord. And I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful, for Lord, for what you've done in my life, just the change of direction, that you would save me from my sins. I'm undeserving of that, Lord. I just pray for anybody out here that is struggling with that, that doesn't know that Jesus is God or just heard that Jesus is God, that maybe we could talk about that. Or maybe they could talk to one of the pastors about that. I just thank you that you would reveal that to me. I just thank you for that change in my life. I thank you that you would use a young lady, a teenager, to uh, bring that to my toddler daughter to change my life. And I pray that lives are changed through that as well. And uh, Lord, I just thank you again for your love for us through our salvation in Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.